Okay, welcome to the first go-to session for the final week of the course. So, yoo-hoo, we're almost done. We're almost, we're almost there, right? This is week four. Um, a quick reminder, there are only a couple things to do this week. There are two activities, or excuse me, ungraded discussions that you're, you should be participating in. Um, okay, moral operating system and how YouTube thinks about copyright. They're both pretty good. I like the YouTube one a little bit more just because I think it's more interesting and and it has a more direct connection to what we'll talk about today. There's also a digital literacy vision project, and I'm not going to go over this the way that I do with other assignments. It really is just sort of a revision of what you did way back in week one. Remember in week one you created um, an original project that captured your digital identity, and you wrote a paragraph about it, and you responded to at least two other classmates. You're doing the, thing again, the same thing again, but you're just updating your vision I mean mo most people kind of create an entirely new vision it might be similar in some ways to the original but it's significantly different uh, but the goal here is that hopefully after nearly four weeks in the course you have a richer sense of what digital citizenship and identity mean and that your new paragraph of explanation and your new vision should reflect that um, so that's the graded discussion for this week um, and the 4.5 assignment, bringing it all together, I'll talk about on Thursday. Uh, Thursday session, by the way, try to attend because it's it's going to be short. Um, it's the final session. I don't have as much to go over. It doesn't take as long to explain the final assignment. Um, and just to give a sneak peek, the final assignment is, is much... I mean, there it's, it's actually... There's quite a bit of work, I think, that's involved, but it's not... It's entirely textual, so you don't have to worry about Digo or finding AP images or navigating websites. It's it's completely textual, uh, but we'll get into that on Thursday. Okay, so today's focus is on copyright, and students tend to like maybe this go-to session the most because they find it the most interesting, the most practical, the most useful. Um, I'm going to try to give a general sense of not just copyright, but all the things that exist out there, um, issues of fair use, Creative Commons, Probably a lot of you have heard that term, and you may generally know what it means, but I'll, I'll explain it in more depth. Um, Royalty-free. For example, we'll get into the issue that Creative Commons is actually the free stuff, and royalty-free, even though it has that word free in it, is not free at all. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into defining these terms so you have a general idea of, of the landscape that we're dealing with. Because uh, it's important to know, most of your industries are going to deal with copyright issues. Some of you are heading into film, music, uh, graphic design, etc right all these areas deal with 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 copyright issues so you should have a general sense of what this means you'll probably get more information as you get deeper into your programs but that's why I keep the focus uh, kind of general okay so yeah here's what I'll cover I mentioned some of them already in passing copyright fair use creative commons royalty free public domain um, and then if people do have questions or comments or or they can share examples um, feel free to do so not just at the end, but even you can use the chat box or raise your hand. Okay, so let's dive right in. I think people generally know what copyright means. Like, it's, it's pretty rare to find someone who doesn't know the gist of it. Um, but, you know, anything that you create, anything that's sort of new, that you, you've written a song, you've written a story, um, if you truly want to protect it, you can create an actual copyright this is done through the copyright office for a fee I believe the fee is around fifty dollars um, and if any significant changes are made to that work you need to copyright it again um, there are other issues that get involved here for example if I write a short story my background is in fiction writing by the way I can do other things but that's sort of my area of, of expertise and training um, if I write a story, do I run and spend fifty dollars to get a copyright? No, of course not. I don't. I don't think it has that kind of value attached to it. Uh, typically, if it's something that you feel important about and want to protect and feel that it has monetary value, that's when you need to get things copyrighted. Um, and then, just when things get published, that creates an official copyright. So if I get a if I get a work accepted in a journal or a magazine, I mean it will automatically become copyrighted just by appearing in print. Um, and similar things happen, for example, if you write a song and it gets released through a label or, or, or something like that. Uh, but technically, yeah, in order to, to fully protect anything anything that you've created, you need to officially pay and receive um, an official copyright. Okay, And we know that use of copyrighted material 
when it's not permitted is called copyright infringement. And a couple of things here, because I, I'll i give an example Oops, in just a second of how this actually came up in a class just the other day. But have people heard of either of these? I like to call them urban legends, um, the eight-second rule. Sometimes I've heard it called the two-second rule. Um, or actually, let's start with that one. Has anybody heard this, this sort of urban legend about well, if you only use two seconds of a song or fewer than eight seconds of a song, you're okay, uh, but but it's free for you to use because you're not using the entire piece. You're just using a little bit. Has anybody heard this sort of passed around as sort of general knowledge? Yes, no? Okay, Jason says no. Taylor said he heard it back way back when. Well, it actually came up the other day in class, okay? It was in an English class, and for their final projects, they have to create these multimedia projects, which means that some of them will use music, some of them will use images. And a couple of students started getting into the debate right there about how much they could use, how much they couldn't use, if they're altering it enough, in other words, altering the speed of a sample or changing its pitch. Um, and they were getting into this argument, well, if you use two seconds or fewer, that's okay. And right there and then, because I also teach this course on GGL, I explained that that's a myth. Okay? Even a single note can technically be copyright infringement. I mean, I'm using song as an example, just because the eight second rule, or I've, I guess it's been reduced now to the two second rule. Um, I've heard that so often that we're going to look at that specific example. <clears throat> but even a single note in music can be technically copyright infringement. Lawrence says, and any note you use as cop? No, I, I, we're going to get into this a bit more in depth, but it's, is it a recognizable feature of the song? Can it readily be identified or confused with the original work? And is it somehow taking away um, potential profits from that work? Or just you're not referencing that work officially? I mean, unfortunately, I have like bad dated examples, but <laughs> there's a famous Beatles song called uh, A Day in the Life. It ends with this chord. A chord that was created using like multiple pianos and multiple like that chord is so famous even though it's technically well I mean a chord is actually a combination of notes but it's still a chord is written in a single key but still that chord is so recognizable that if it appears in your song there are a bunch of people who will who, who will instantly know where that comes from or there's like a famous uh, wavering trumpet part that begins uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue like, there's another good example, right? People hear that, and they know where that comes from, even if it's under two seconds, or even if it's a single note. Uh, yeah, Lauren mentions Ice Ice Baby, the Queen song. Yeah, that, and by the way, that's a good example, because all of these were tested early on. Like, uh, I, I believe Vanilla Ice, there, there was initially going to be a court case, but it got settled, because eventually they settled. Um, you might remember that song from the early 90s, the MC Hammer song, um... Uh, oh, what's it called? Is it called Hammer Time? Or no, I don't know. Why am I not? It's it's the one that uses that Rick James sample from Superfly. Can't touch this. Thank you, Jason. I'm remember Hammer Time because there's a part in the song where he's like, Hammer Time, and then it goes into the the famous riff. That was another one where it was going to head to the courts until MC Hammer settled out of court. And that's actually been the recent trend: is that people are people understand that they essentially need to. Uh, either pay outright for the sample or what's more likely is that a portion of the of the song's profits so royalties are paid out to the original copyright holder um, but yeah keep in mind as, as, as little as a single note if it's recognizable could technically be copyright infringement um, and using just a couple seconds doesn't cover you because I don't know how long that Queen sample is but it's not terribly long but it's still a recognizable part of that other song um, the second urban myth that's out there that I'm curious if people have heard about is what's called the poor man's copyright. So imagine that you've written the notes for a song and you've actually written them out on, on you know, uh, right, like a, a staff sheet, or you've written a story, or you've written a script for for a potential Hollywood movie. Um, the poor man's copyright is this idea that you can just take that piece of paper, put it in an envelope, address it to yourself, send it through the mail. And then when you receive that letter, 
that that's proof that you that it's yours because it's you know you you don't open it it's time stamped from the the postal service have people heard about this one i mean i call it the poor man's copyright it's it's basically kind of the us mail trick that that's a way to sort of get around paying the $50 for an official copyright okay so yeah so lauren's heard it um i heard it from a professor like 20 years ago she was like oh yeah 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 that's all you need to do um that's not true either um, at least not in terms of, like, if you actually have to appear in court. That that by itself is not typically strong enough legally. Um, it may, I mean, it might scare off people if people try to steal your work and you can say, hey, 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 look, this really is mine. I mean, that might not be enough to deter them, but it's not a strong enough case legally to establish copyright um, completely. So be aware of these myths that float out there. Um, by the way, the, the, the two-second rule or the eight-second rule when it came up in class the other day, luckily I had a teacher who was observing me that day, and he teaches the business overview course, which a lot of you will take in month four. And, yeah, it was nice. I mean, I already knew the answer, but, like, he backed me up on that as well, that there's no such thing as, uh, you know, you could take a, a few seconds and you're okay. Which, um, oh, okay, yeah, real quickly, uh, I'll just breeze through these because most people know this the typical examples of copyrightable work so we know literary examples novels poems articles uh, software believe it or not typically falls into the literary category you wouldn't think of software that way but technically it's written using code uh, it's written in its own language so it, it typically falls into the category of literary um, so anything musical songs jingles beats so we're getting into that weird kind of category where even beats can be recognizable um, anything dramatic, plays, performances, so, you know, musicals, operas, um, which is, you know, a, a step above just songs and jingles, right? An entire musical is also a copyrightable work. Uh, choreography, you might not think so, but that's protected. If a specific dance is created by someone, um, that can be protected. Anything pictorial, graphical, sculptural. Uh, sound recordings, so lectures, old radio broadcasts, um, you know, anything that's basically sound-based that isn't necessarily a song or, or a jingle can be protected. And we all know about movie, move motion pictures and, and television. Um, here are some quick things that are non-copyrightable, although they're often protected under different means. So, for example... Uh, People's names, titles, th those typically aren't protected, unless it's like a corporate name or something. But, you know, you're free to create a story whose character is my name. I'll be flattered, unless the, the character is really uh, poorly <laughs> poorly expressed, like if he's a, a complete jerk. But, yeah, I mean, people's names uh, aren't protected. Titles, that's really interesting, too. Like, titles are not protected. Um, again, I, I apologize because all of my references sometimes are a little bit older. But like in the 1980s, there was this pretty famous punk group called The Replacements. And one of their albums was called Let It Be. And if you know Let It Be, that's also the title of not only a Beatles song, but a Beatles album. So why could they title their record Let It Be? It's because titles are, are, are not copyrightable. Okay, And you, in, it's kind of, in, kind of common sense because... I can't think of great examples off the top of my head, so maybe you have. But haven't you seen like songs that aren't the same, but they have the same title? Or sometimes a movie will have the same title as a song or some other work, not intentionally, but it just it happens. Um, for example, back in the 1930s, there was a, a big hit song called Dancing in the Dark. Bruce Springsteen in the 1980s had a song called Dancing in the Dark. They're not the same song. Springsteen didn't do a cover of this older song. It's just that these two songs happen to have the same title. Um, short phrases, slogans, again, it depends, right? If they're a, if they're a corporate slogan, um, they will they could be protected, but under different rules. Not copyright, though. Um, that typically falls under trademark. So, you know, what are some s slogans? What's McDonald's slogan? Is, isn't it like just loving it or something or, or, or something like that? Um, so those things can be protected, but under different categories. Um, ingredients, ideas, procedures. So we're talking about like uh, scientific procedures, um, things that are kind of in th that realm. Um, they can be protected too, but they're protected under not copyright, but patents, right? So if you come up with an interesting invention 
or, or a very, very specific surgical procedure, those actually can be protected. I'm loving it. Have your way. Burger King. Okay, yeah. Like, those are those are super protected. <clears throat> and, and when I say super protected, like, I mean, sometimes companies, in my opinion, go overboard. So, you know those Chick-fil-A commercials with the cows that are always reminding people to not eat burgers and eat chicken instead? That's the joke, right? That the cows kind of want to stay alive. Kind of a creepy commercial when you think about it. But part of the joke is that the, the cows are always holding up signs like eat more, eat more chicken. But the, the letters are reversed and it's because, you know, they're cows. They don't, they don't know how to write. Um, anyway, there was this guy in Vermont who was selling uh, T-shirts called Eat More Kale. And Chick-fil-A, like, came down on him. I, I have no idea how that the, the decision turned out. But um, Chick-fil-A, I, I, I think, would have had a case if, for example, the T-shirts pictured, I don't know, this would be, like, the worst concept ever, but the actual vegetable kale rendered as a cartoon encouraging you to, 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 to or, 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 excuse me, a cartoon carrot encouraging you to eat more kale and all the words are mis, you know, spelled backwards or whatever. Like, that would be an infringement because it's borrowing the concept or the idea. But he, the guy wasn't doing that. They were literally just uh, T-shirts that said, eat more kale. Um, and it became controversial about, I don't know, 18 months ago because it, it, it brought into questions like, can a corporation own the simple words, eat more? It seems like that can't, <laughs> you can't own that. Uh, but, yeah, people go to lengths to really protect... Um, their material. Okay, so cruising along. Uh, familiar symbols or designs. Again, those are usually come covered under trademarks, um, which is what I say in the final point, point here. Okay, so let's get into this issue of fair use, because this is something I have to explain to students a lot, because the two-second rule or the eight-second rule is kind of blurring into issues of fair use, which is when can you use other people's works and how much can you use? In essence, the two-second rule is almost trying to argue fair use. But that's a term that gets thrown out of, uh, a lot, but people don't completely understand what that means. And actually, fair use has very, very specific uh, guidelines to qualify as fair use. Um, and yeah, this slide gets to the gist of it. Like, So uh, if you're going to use a copyright work, it might be considered OK for you to use, right? So fair use. If it falls under the categories of criticism, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. Okay? So can you think of examples of like those categories that you've seen in the real world where someone is using a portion of someone else's work but it fits one of those categories? Can anybody think of an example off the top of their head? Like there are some real basic ones that are I think pretty obvious if you think about what you see on television or, or sometimes even online. When have you seen copyrighted works used in an okay way like someone shows a portion of a film someone uses i don't know a portion of someone's book any ideas any thoughts none That Starbucks thing. I'm not sure what that Starbucks thing means. Uh, I've, it's if, if, I don't know. Uh, like sometimes I'm out of touch with what people are are paying attention to out there. So I don't know if you're referring to some sort of commercial or if you're talking about the stores themselves when you walk in and they're playing music or something. But okay, here's a here's a real quick example. Like you're watching, I don't know, uh, one of those uh, entertainment programs on television. They might show clips of a movie, or someone's doing a movie review and they show a few clips from the, the film. Okay, so there would be ex an example of fair use, right? It's being used in news reporting. Um, so reviews are, are a popular thing. At the very most basic level, think of how you, you you quote material sometimes when you write a paper, right? You quote, you give, you provide a citation. Um, but you're, you're giving credit that the, the material comes from somewhere else. Or if someone writes a book review, they might actually share, um, you know, a paragraph's worth of, of, of a passage from the book, but they're not reproducing the entire thing. Or in teaching, uh, I've taught introduction to film. So obviously we have screenings of entire films. 
that's allowed though because it's for teaching purposes um, so if it has a legitimate use it can be considered fair use uh, but fair use doesn't cover things like and this is what I have to explain to students it doesn't allow you for example to take a Taylor Swift song and have it play in the background of your project that you're handing in for class now is Taylor Swift really gonna come down on you if she finds out that you're doing that no probably not because as we'll get to in just a second I mean profit sort of drives people's decisions whether to enforce copyright or not uh, the YouTube video uh, that's up on your activities board if you haven't watched yet uh, they give an example of that I forget which song it is but they give the example of a song that had come out been on the charts disappeared but then it became a hit again because someone posted a sort of funny wedding video where the song is featured it was playing in the background um, and yeah as copyright holders they could have went after that video but why I mean it, it brought new attention to the song the song re-entered the charts um, so yeah, it's, it should come as no surprise that that profit issues <laughs> determine things. Um, so yeah, Taylor Swift isn't going to descend on you because you're using her music, but still at full sale because we're trying to teach things the right way and because we want to make sure that when you enter your industry that you're not just taking things at random and using them without permission. You, we're we're pretty tough on that. Um, okay. And real quickly, a few of the other points here that, yeah, fair use uh, is any copying or copyright material done for a limited and transformative purpose. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. So uses such as commenting upon, critiquing, parroting. Parody is protected. If you've ever wondered why Weird Al Yankovic, who for some reason has become hot again, he had that parody song that, that used uh, Robin Thicke's blurred lines, right? And he always does that on all of his albums. He takes famous songs and rewrites them as parodies. Parody is protected. Um, so all those things fall under fair use. Um, fair use is a defense against a claim. So someone accuses you, right, of copyright infringement. Um, you can use fair use of as a defense um, if it meets the requirements. Okay, And if it does so, then you're not technically in infringement territory um, and there are basically four issues that the courts consider when deciding whether you're using something fairly and here they are uh, the purpose and character of your use right so why are you using this um, again I mean Weird Al Yankovic passes the test because he's clearly doing it for parody reasons um, the nature of the copyrighted work so what you're using the amount that you're using so yeah that sounds like it's kind of getting into the two second rule um, there is no two second rule but yeah one of the things they have to consider is how much are you using and how much of an and how, how much is that recognizable as being part of the original work so perhaps you might not get accused of copyright infringement if you're using some non-essential part of a song that hardly anybody would recognize and certainly wouldn't probably affect the original copyright holder in terms of uh, that person's ability to earn profit um, and that gets in this last category uh, the effect of the use on the potential market okay so yeah if, if 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 someone's sampling something recognizable from your work whether it's music or film uh, and so on and the use of that is helping that person sell a lot of records or sell a lot of books or you know what whatever it is um, that's an issue to, to consider as well um, because yeah I mean money kind of drives things so it's really in some ways more of a market issue than anything else that that drives people to try to enforce a copyright I'm thinking about YouTube uh, also, I mean, maybe you guys spend most of your time watching cat videos or viral videos. I mostly go to YouTube because it's like a, it's like a free jukebox. I know there's st streaming music services, but I don't like the ones that force you to, you know, you can't f skip past a song or you don't have complete control. YouTube, you know, you you a song comes to mind, you could type it in, and probably it's up there for you. But have you have you ever noticed that in addition to let's say an artist's official video? people create their own sort of videos to accompany a song they're called like lyric videos uh, and sometimes they just have the lyrics sc scrolling across the screen but other times people have like images of the artist 
They'll put together their own collage. Sometimes they'll put in their own personal photos, and then the song acts as a sort of uh, backdrop. And you wonder, like, okay, technically, the artist could go after these people, but why? Like, some of these lyric videos, even though they're not the official video, which gets the most views typically, uh, you know, if there's a current hit song out there, so if it's the new Taylor Swift song, or, you know, I forget what, or Blurred Lines last summer was the song of the summer, or this summer it was Iggy Azalea's Fancy, right? Like, sometimes even the lyric videos that were created just by regular users get millions of views. So why would Taylor or Iggy or Robin Thicke try to put a stop to that? I mean, it's it's sort of like free marketing. It's sort of free publicity. Um, so yeah, its impact on the market is a big determining factor whether they're going to go after you or not. However, if you create something that's so specific and upload it to YouTube and you're making profits off of it somehow, then don't be surprised if, if the copyright infringement gets enforced. Um, and yeah, and watch that YouTube video that's that's part of the discussion for this week because it, it really is interesting um, because it gets into these issues of how YouTube tries to sort through the videos that get uploaded daily and it's shocking when you see just how much material is uploaded <laughs> daily. And yeah, there are some people who are a bit more strict and want all sort of references to their music or their film eliminated and there are others that are a bit looser we're entering a very very weird period here where i think that people need to sort of we're, we're rethinking the notion of what it means to be a sharing community because we are online so much and what's allowable what isn't and also for the artists themselves like when should they step in when shouldn't they i mean it was much easier 25 years ago uh, 25 years ago, if someone was just using your work in any way that you didn't like, you typically step in to, to protect your work. But now because there's this added benefit of, hey, people are creating their own content, kind of, and they haven't asked for uh, express permission, but this is helping me, right? If, if people, if 10 million people are listening to my song, <clears throat> um, that's terrific. Why would I want to stop that? And real quickly, before we move on to the next topic, you always see on YouTube, like these users who, who, who issue these statements, like, uh, so they'll have a lyric video accompanying, I don't know, a Kesha song. And they'll say, I do not own this song. I'm not the copyright holder, but under fair use, blah, blah, blah. And technically, it's, it's not really fair use. They think it is. They think fair use covers their ability just to post songs. Uh, but that's actually not true. Okay, so the next area is Creative Commons. Have most people heard of this term? Like, uh, I think it's, it's well, to use the word, it's, I think it's pretty common nowadays. Um, creative Commons is actually an organization. Okay, so it's an, it's an official entity. It's a nonprofit organization devoted to expanding the range of creative works available to others to build upon legally and to share. So it's getting into issues that we just talked about. Right, that there's there's an understanding that in today's world to participate fully in you know everything from Facebook to creation of websites to whatever, it's just we're 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 a society that's more dependent upon images and sounds um, and lots of multimedia file types, and we we can't really I, or we could insist that everybody create their own material but that would make for a less robust online experience so for people to be able to participate fully they sort of need access to the sorts of things we're not all going to run out our door and snap pictures uh... in order to post a, a funny you know how people share things on facebook they're called memes right these these sorts of messages that go viral um, and become part of the culture they always seem to be related to cats too for some reason i i, I don't know why that is but, you know, someone posts a funny image and it's got a kind of a funny slogan on there. Like, we're not all going to run out and take photos to create these things. Um, so there's an understanding that we need a pool of sort of resources and materials um, that can be shared legally. And that's what Creative Commons is. Okay. And that's kind of what the second bullet point stresses here. That this was basically invented to create a more flexible copyright model. Um, essentially replacing all rights reserved, which is kind of the system we had in place for the longest time. You create something, you own it, nobody else can touch it, to some rights reserved. And I'm going to get away from the PowerPoint for just a second. Here I have the Creative Commons website. 
Okay, so it's just creativecommons.org. You, pr you probably won't need to gear go here much yourself. But like if I click on licenses, you can see the different categories of licenses that exist. Um, everything from the least restrictive to the most restrictive. So for example, I'm not going to go through each of these, but the least uh, restrictive is this one here where this license because when you create something you can officially submit it to um, a Creative Commons bank of materials like there's the, like uh, Flickr some of that material is copyrighted but some of it's allowed to be used but you can also d d choose the level of, of how allowable you want it to be shared so this is like the least restrictive it allows you to distribute remix tweak build upon even for profit okay even commercially uh, and as it says, this is the most accommodating of all licenses. So anything that has this specific attribution, you can basically do whatever you want with it. Change it, alter it, make a lot of money off of it. So I don't know, if you're starting a small business and you want to alter something so it becomes your logo, perfectly okay. You want to take a sound file and it becomes part of your song, it becomes a smash hit, perfectly okay. Uh, and then if we go to the very bottom here on the right, this is like the most restrictive uh, level of Creative Commons. Um, it only allows you to download the work and share it with others as long as they credit you. Okay, but you can't change it in any way or use it to, to make a profit. So if you're ever curious, just look at the different levels of Creative Commons uh, materials. But basically this is the stuff we can either use for creative purposes or business purposes or just sharing purposes okay so photos someone create a photo you think it's cool you want to share it with someone else as long as it's creative commons you're allowed to do so now the great thing about creative commons is that it's free i mean this is the point of it it's let's create a data bank or a pool of materials that people can use legally right so sound files images um animated clips okay so they're meant for sharing and sometimes altering uh and they're completely free royalty free which is a term i'm sure you've heard of a lot is not free that's a complete misnomer actually it's not a misnomer it's it's pretty accurate it's just that it can cause confusion because it has the, the word free in there um essentially it means that you're free from having to pay royalties so for example media right so music graphics photos whatever you pay for a certain item for a one-time fee um okay and once you pay that fee it's yours to use because normally some people mentioned earlier these these famous examples of vanilla ice's song ice ice baby or the mc hammer song uh can't touch this right in those cases you're going to pay out royalties typically to the original copyright holder you you're able to use that part of the song you're able to turn it into a big hit. You'll make some nice money from it. But at the same time, you're going to pay ongoing payments because that's what royalties are, ongoing payments to the original creator of that material. Royalty-free just means that you're paying a one-time fee for that thing, and then it's essentially yours. Okay, And the royalty could be as cheap as a buck. There are some photo sites out there where you can purchase a photo for a for dollar, and then it's free for, your, for you to use. Use it in your, your company's brochure. Use it, I don't know, on your CD cover. Use it however you want. You've already paid that fee. Um, oops, I didn't mean to flip ahead yet. Yeah, it's subjected to certain guidelines, but basically the user of the purchase material uh, can use the material as many times as she or he wants. So once you purchase it, it's yours, um, including for uh, profit purposes, okay? So like commercial ventures. Uh, but that's royalty free. You pay for it and then you own it. Um, a couple other quick categories. Public domain, domain. Okay, copyrights don't last forever. Although our US Congress, I don't know if everybody here is, is from the US. We do have international students who, who attend full sale. But in the US at least, Congress has been renewing <laughs> the length of copyrights. It used to be that copyrights would expire 50 years after the death of the creator. Uh, but that got extended to 70 years. And in the case of corporate created works, 
the length was 70 years, but it, it's now been extended to 120 years. So it's often jokingly referred to, Congress's decision that is, to, to extend copyright life as the Mickey Mouse decision. Here in Orlando, we have Disney World. Um, because there were certain <laughs> families, sometimes corporate families, so the Disney family, uh, the Gershwin family, they were another famous example, who basically weren't happy with the fact that their copyrights were about to expire. Right? Because when the copyright expires on Mickey Mouse, then Mickey Mouse is free for anybody to use. Um, and that's something that Walt Disney wants to wants to protect. So yeah, we've had some... I'm not trying to get political, but we've had some interesting issues where Congress is sort of changing the rules, making it longer. Um, I believe in 19... or excuse me, 2019, the, the most recent extensions will expire. But there's already talk that they'll be renewed again. Uh, but th this is not the gist of copyright. The idea of copyright is that after a certain period of time, the value of that copyrighted work should no longer be so powerful uh, that it's that it's you know it's not supposed to be pr protected for infinity, um, and that typically when copyright expires, then it enters the public domain. And I don't know how interested you guys are in this stuff, but there's a lot of cool public domain stuff out there. Like you don't have to pay for I don't know Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. You don't have to pay for the sheet music to those those Scott Joplin ragtime songs for, on, on piano. Um, so if you're ever interested in public domain things, like there are lots of websites devoted to them, and you can find some cool things. You can find novels you can read for free. You can find free sheet music. If it's old enough, you can maybe even find sound files that are no longer protected by copyright. Uh, but when copyright expires, it does enter public domain. Okay, any questions that people have about copyright in general? I mean, I just wanted this to be a sort of a shorter session that gives you the general scope of things. Um, there are some areas where there's, this is still being negotiated. Video games, like what do you do with that? I'm, I'm talking about not like pirating video games, but like YouTube has lots of videos devoted to walkthroughs. Um, things like that. The gaming community tends to be more open about things, but there are certain companies like Nintendo that have been enforcing things pretty harshly. Um, so it, it's it's very much a, a period of ne negotiation that we're going through in 2014. But are there any questions at all about copyright issues or fair use? No? Are we good to go? I feel like I've lost my, my audience here. Okay, uh, I'm not going to make people... By the way, Thursday session will probably be around this long as well. Uh, during the last week, I don't want to belabor certain points that I need to cover. Uh, so Thursday, I'm basically going to give people a, a sort of in-depth look at the final project. So if you can, try to attend that on Thursday. Same bad time, same bad channel. Uh, but if you're okay, go ahead and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and make sure that you complete the assignments for this week. Thanks for attending.